contemporary art. Uh, just a basic definition. Um, contemporary is a, is a definition of time. So all art at one point was contemporary art. Um, modern art is not now. Uh, most, some of you probably already know that. But modern art was actually a distinct time period. Um, whereas contemporary art is what we're talking about right now. So for, for classification terms, I'm saying that's 1980 to the present. There are a lot of themes that we'll go over that kind of lump all that together. Um, but the contemporary period can be, some people say it started in the 60s, but I think that's completely different. Um, uh, you, okay, everyone's got their packets, right. Um, there's a diagram at the top to kind of start everything off. Um, you'd always use the quote to define the art world as systems of reception where distinction is conferred. So these are kind of the five points of that, um, the five general players within the art world. You have to be one of these five things to really participate. All of public is a part of uh, art. Everyone can participate in that, but public is for the most part left out of the high end art world, which is what we're talking about. So on that diagram, you'll see on the left-hand side is the people who are involved in the money of it. You've got collectors and dealers. And the middle is kind of the artist who floats back and forth. And now on the right side is your idea, which is critics and um, curators. Uh, art is very social. Uh, I would argue that doing art that no one sees doesn't make you an artist. If you don't know about it, no one sees it. Um, you're not really contributing to the art world. So art is something very social. It's something you have to interact with other people with. As an artist, you have to deal with dealers, you have to deal with curators, you have to deal with the public. Um, you go to gallery openings, uh, which are kind of the big party payoff at the end of the long series that you've been working on. Um, so it's that whole, if a tree falls in the forest, doesn't make a sound thing. I would argue it doesn't make a sound. So, you know, whatever. Um, so that's the diagram. Um, right underneath that is a photo called The Irascibles. It was taken by Nina Lean. It was published in, I believe, Time magazine. Um, it was, it's become a very iconic photo of the 1960s. Uh, there was an art exhibit done by the Met uh, that was American Art Now, and the curator for it hated abstract art and made no attempt to hide that. He called the Met the whorehouse on 53rd Street, I believe, uh, because it was so contemporary with uh, abstract art. So he left out most of the artists who were working in abstract art. So they wrote a piece uh, into the New York Times complaining that they were being left out of it. Uh, Nina Lean came and photographed these people, um, and it ended up becoming most of the people in that photograph were the people we associate with the 1960s. Um, in the top left corner is Willem de Kooning uh, with the white hair. Uh, to his right is Ad Reinhardt, uh, who tried to end painting unsuccessfully, as many people do. Um, uh, the, the only woman in that painting is uh, Hedda Stern, which is a reason a lot of feminists hate abstract expressionists. There's only one woman in that photograph, which kind of sums it up. The abstract expressionists married women, but they didn't let women participate. Uh, so. It was an all-boys club. Um, but to the right of her is Clifford Still, and if I'm remembering correctly, Robert Motherwell. Jackson Pollock's kind of in the middle, striking a pose, leaning on one knee. Barnett Newman's on the stool. Um, Rothko is off to the right, uh, thinking very seriously and deeply about what he's about ready to work on. So this is kind of the, uh, this photo is a really good description of artists. Um, you see that the artists aren't wearing terribly nice clothes. Some of them do for effect. Um, but for the most part, artists in the 60s and before that were working class people. Uh, it was very, a lot of the artists working at that time uh, had dead end jobs that they worked at. Um, let's see, a few of them worked at a steel factory. A lot of them were with the, uh, the Public Works Commission um, for art. But uh, they, were, they were very much the democratic version of art. They were the every man's man, which isn't necessarily true anymore. Um, so that's kind of the artist, which is obviously the most important, or the, the biggest part of the art world. But that being said, um, there are people just as important to the art world. Um, 
and the artists wouldn't be able to do what they do without them, uh, such as critics. Uh, the foremost critic of the 20th century, arguably, would be Clement Greenberg, and uh, he really crossed over uh, with the artists and actually helped Pollock name some of his titles, which is something that you know, question the ethics of. He, he was really involved with the abstract expressionists and, and really a, in a lot of ways was accused of using them as pawns for his own thing, which John Ruskin also did back with the pre-Raphaelites. Um, but he was a formalist. He believed that every art should be, uh, or all art should be uh, criticized from a formal point of view, so weight, uh, line, um, uh, composition, and things like that. That's how he approached art. And abstract expressionism was the new frontier being created. Um, Pollock was taking easel painting and destroying it and going to murals. That's why it works so large. And uh, disrupting the picture plane and destroying the modernist grid that was started before him. Um, there's also Michael Fried in the 70s and 80s, who was a big critic. He was for minimalism. Uh, he wrote a very important work, Art and Objecthood, which is still read. Um, it was really trying to defeat the new minimalists, which he thought were too theatrical. Um, but his big people were Frank Stella and the, the original uh, minimalists who were just uh, not questioning objecthood too much. He didn't think painting should spill over into sculpture. Uh, you had Harold Rosenberg, who couldn't have been more opposite to Michael Fried who believed that uh, uh, the abstract expressionists were the best movement to exist, so he was along the lines of Clement Greenberg. Um, Hilton Kramer uh, is the most didactic of all the critics. He believes that postmodernism, if it fringes on postmodernism, it was awful. Only modernists were good. And even though he's writing the, primarily the 60s, 70s, and 80s, he believed Joe Miro was the pinnacle of all art. Um, and anyone trying to do anything else was out of their mind. Uh, Arthur C. Danto was probably the only critic to come out of that era that embraced postmodernism as saying that uh, he had the broadest definition of what art could be and really um, championed people doing uh, non-formalist things within their work. Um, today, you have Jer uh, James Yu, which I also mentioned. Jerry Saltz is a critic uh, in New York. Um, but critics are really important. They define the artist's work. Um, and in a lot of ways, bring artists' attention, even when they criticize them. Yet, you know, it's no press is bad press. So, or, I'm sorry, right? Um, you know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, then also on that scale are the curators, which uh, are kind of, in my opinion, the most interesting category and the most relevant category in the last 20 years. Um, curators are kind of the new power structure within art. They always have been. Uh, curators have ha always had the ability to group you. You went from being an individual artist, a curator takes you and throws you in with 10 other people, and suddenly you're an impressionist or a waiba or an abstract expressionist just because someone shows you with other people. So they've always had power, but um, the curatorial system now uh, has taken over a whole new approach. And by far, in my opinion, it's starting to get to the point where the curator is more important than the artist. And artists are becoming curators, which is an interesting phenomenon. Um, and it was predicted. Uh, there's an essay in this book. I was going to print essays for you again ridiculous. Uh, so we have this very humble pharmacy library. Uh, they're all here. Um, if you get the chance, if you want to set up an appointment to read these or try to find them online, by all means, please do that. Uh, this is called The Curator's Moment. It's written in 1997. It said that this was going to happen. It's absolutely true, 10 years later. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, well, there are a lot of reasons. There are, there are a lot of climate things going on within art. Um, that have made this a possibility. Uh, postmodern art, which we'll get more into with postmodernism, the definition of that, or an attempted definition. Um, artists are, are trying to demystify the role of the art, of the artist in, in culture. So they're trying to um, kind of question their agency and also take the heroism out of being an artist. So artists right now are making work that 
is indistinguishable from any other artist or any other person. They're collecting things, they're um, taking works and taking the artist's hand out of the work. That's usually kind of the code for it. Um, it's work that could be done by anyone and it doesn't signify any one person doing it, which will, makes it hard to tell artists apart. Um, it makes sense in what's going on for the artist to do that. So the curators coming along right at that time um, are starting to group artists together in very large numbers. And when you get a room uh, full of artists, if there's a hundred of them in a single show, it becomes really hard to pull out one artist and remember that person's name or uh, try to learn anything more about them because they're one of a hundred and all that looks, there's no distinguishing marks within it because that's kind of the, the um, the, the ethos of postmodern artwork anyway. So the curator is the only person you remember from that. The person who organized the entire show is the person that you go, or, or the institution that organized it. Um, so we, uh, to, uh, we have, within that, we have uh, the Artists Younger Than Jesus show, which has now um, been turned into a triennial, um, where they take 50 artists who are all younger than 33 when Jesus died, and um, they throw, they shoot these artists out of a cannon um, at the new museum, essentially. 50 artists, like that, that's a huge curated show. There's no way you're going to remember anyone when there are 49 other people around them. So um, you remember Lauren Cornell, who kind of came up with the idea and started curating it. Um, and uh, the, the Guggenheim now does a YouTube show, which you might have heard of, where they take they had like 20,000 submissions, I think, for the last one, and whittled it down to 150 YouTube videos that they showed in the Guggenheim. No one's going to remember the screen name or the YouTube person, or the person who made the YouTube video. You're only going to remember the Guggenheim did it, and the curators behind it who have written the essays to go with it, trying to make sense of all of it. So the curators really become the, the new power, which I think is kind of an interesting shift, and indicative of postmodern art. Um, no one cared about curators 30 years ago, and that's kind of a new phenomenon. Moving right along, collectors. Uh, no one likes collectors. No one interacts with collectors. Um, they have money. They're hard to deal with. They don't understand art most of the time, and that's all there is to say about it, really. Uh, try and understand collectors will just drive an artist crazy. Um, which is why artists rarely deal with collectors firsthand. They usually deal with dealers who are still important and have always been important, but they're always kind of the backseat to artists. The Impressionists, as we know them, wouldn't exist had Henri Durand Ruel, who is their dealer, not bought all their artwork and taken it to New York in the Armory show or disperse that work around. So, Usually dealers are the reasons why we remember an artist, um, which people don't usually give them that credit. Uh, Leo Castelli in the 60s is another famous dealer. He dealt Warhol, uh, created Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg's career out of nothing. Um, a lot of the kind of post-minimal, post-pop uh, work in the 70s and 80s is owed to Leo Castelli. If you were in his... Um, Systems of reception where in distinction are con conferred. Yeah. Um, that's branding. That's just another phrase for branding in any other marketing ploy. So this is all, these five people all have the power to brand. Like being bought by the right collector makes all of your work be worth more money. Being sold by the right dealer makes all of your work be worth more. Um, curated by the right person um, can affect your entire career. So dealers, um, some of them are branded, like uh, Larry Gagosian, uh, who runs Gagosian Gallery in New York, um, David Zorner, who runs David Zorner Gallery, uh, um, uh, what's her first name? Stefania, Stefania Bordolami, who runs Bordolami Gallery. Most of them name the galleries after themselves as some kind of initiative to be remembered for what they're doing. Um, the same can be said in Chicago. Peter Miller Gallery, Kava Gupta. Uh, these are people that if you show with them, you're more important than someone who doesn't. Um, so branding is very important. Collectors who can brand you, um, the only one I can really think of 
is uh, Charles Saatchi, who, uh, this is probably the only time in history that I know that this happened in art history, except for the Renaissance. The collector defined an entire movement. Uh, whatever Saatchi bought in the 90s became part of the Waiba art movement, the young British artists. So being bought by him made your work important. Um, I don't think that happens too often. So that, that's another person who uh, brands your work. But going back to the dealers, um, these are people that, not to generalize them too much, but most dealers uh, come from money. They're born into it. Uh, but a lot of them are kind of uh, distanced from it uh, through rebellion or through wanting to cut their own path. Art is a really sexy entrepreneurial venture. Selling art to people for millions of dollars is what they chase after. And so they deal with the collectors for the artists and use the networks they already have to sell artwork. Um, so that's kind of the role of the, the dealer. The dealer keeps the artist away from the collector as much as they possibly can. Um, most artists I know don't know the people who collect them because then they can cut the dealer out of it dealer doesn't make money, um, dealers die. Uh, but that's also starting to happen, as a side note, but artists are, for the first time in history, this is definitely the first time this is happening, artists are starting to go straight to auction houses to sell their work and go straight to museums to sell their work, um, cutting the dealer out of the equation, which drives them crazy. Um, that's something that's only started happening in the last 20 years as well. Um, Usually you had to die or be very, very, very old and very established to sell your work through auction houses. Um, now Sotheby's and Christie's are selling work by artists who are not only alive, they're in their 30s and 40s. So artists are <laughs> just taking their work, giving it straight to the auction house, watching it be bid on for millions of dollars, taking that money home, and uh, leaving the dealer out of the equation entirely. So that's another uh, contemporary phenomenon that's going on. Um, I think I covered a lot of that. I, I know I ran through that, I'm sorry, uh, but it's just a lot to cover. Um, so that's kind of the, the art world summed up. Does anyone have any questions about that first part, the different rules within the art world? Anyone? Who was the author on that um, essay? Uh, what? With... The curator's moment. Oh, uh, Michael Brenson. Um, what's the book? Oh, this is just a collection of essays. Um, uh, theory in Contemporary Art since 1985. So I just take a lot of the essays that apply today. Um, yeah, that's the. Uh, any other questions? Art and Object Hood was uh, Michael Fried's big work, if you want to go back and read that. It's still pretty relevant to what artists are dealing with now. Um, all right, moving along. Um, there are multiple art worlds. Um, you have to make that distinction. I don't know if really anyone who does, though, or acknowledge the difference between different art worlds that are going on, but it, uh, but it happens. Um, there's no good naming for it that I don't find condescending, so I'm going to try to like not do that. But the people, I, the only way I can really think to do this, and this isn't that, uh, professional, I guess, but I'm going to break it down into the magazines that the art is showing and that people read, because I feel like that kind of sums it up the best for whatever reason. So if you're going to Barnes & Noble or wherever and you're buying art magazines, there are three basic kinds, in my opinion. There's like the, the international artist um, is one, uh, American painter, um, an American art collector, and those Magazines kind of represent this culture that um, is very historicist, which I'll kind of explain what that means briefly. Um, but they favor realism, they like things that look like things, and they favor old technique. They favor people who have technical mastery. Um, so they're, they still think that Velasquez and Sargent and David um, and Rubens and Vermeer, they, they still think those are the best artists of all time. Um, 
stuff going on, postmodern, uh, they think is awful and disgusting and ruining art. Um, all these art worlds don't get along, by the way. And they all try not to acknowledge the existence of the other art worlds, but that's why it's hard to name them. Um, but uh, what are ways to describe? Yeah, art that looks like it was made 200 years ago, even though it's made now. That's what they're into. Um, so traditional glazing techniques. Um, you see a lot of still lives. You see lots of portraiture. Um, and those are the and, and the magazines are mostly composed of uh, not essays, but um, visiting an artist's studio and watching them work and watching them set up a painting. If that makes sense. Um, the next art world that is distinct to itself would be subbed up by high fructose and juxtapose. Um, in my opinion, it is high key color, uh, hard edge, uh, pop surrealism kind of work. The meanings behind the artwork is usually very, um, see, I almost say simplistic, that sounds condescending. But you look at the artwork and you get it. Um, there's no trying to extrapolate deep meaning from it. Um, you get the, the visual word pun, or you get the inherent craziness of the image. Um, and everything kind of has this coolness to it. Everything is cool, like, oh, that's really cool if that guy did that, or, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but if you read those magazines, you know what I mean. Like, I, I flip through those magazines and like, I just be like, oh, that's cool, this guy did that. Oh, that's a cool idea, that's cool. So that's kind of what they're into. Again, not a lot of essays. It's more of looking at artists and working in their studios and highlighting what they're working on. Um, and then the high, the high end art world that most of us aren't allowed to know about or is mostly inaccessible for the public would be your art forum and freeze magazine, art news, that are fo and art news really focuses on old artwork still. Um, but those are artists, uh, they're dealing with the avant-garde or the cutting edge. Uh, they usually hate painting, um, favoring installation and relational aesthetics uh, to that. Um, and, and those are made up of ads because that's the only way they can make that ma those magazines happen because people don't like reading them, um, and essays. So it's all ads and essays and then showing work that it's difficult to extrapolate meaning um, and, and try to understand what they're talking about. They're not made to get quickly. All the work, and actually, all the work doesn't translate well because the, the giant ad page ad they take out is usually just like a single box in a big room or something. So without being able to walk around it or understand it, you don't really get it, um, usually. And that's kind of the point. You're not supposed to get it. They don't really care because they're going to sell it for a lot of money anyways, and they don't care about the greater public at all. So that's, and that's, that's the art world we're going to talk about. Um, <laughs> the art world that doesn't care about you, me, or anyone else because they already have money coming in. But that's the art world that no one gets to know about. Um, it's impossible to say this, but their claim is the art they cover is the art that's going to be in history. Like the high fructose, the international artists, those people are great, they'll sell well, they'll have their collectors, but they're not going to be remembered because they're not doing anything new. So Freeze uh, Art Forum, they're showing people that are a part of a greater dialogue that's going to help make sense of everything. 50 years from now, these are the people that will be written about. That's their claim. Um, as I said, the public is part of the art world, but the public is not a part of the contemporary art world. Uh, they are kept out. Um, that's why when most people go into museums, they look at things and they go, my kid could do that. Or um, there are even artists who go out of their way to offend people, uh, not with offensive imagery, but with imagery that's so simple or um, so confusing that your average person will walk in and get mad walking through a museum. We've all heard of people do that. My dad does that. Anytime I drive him through a museum, he gets angrier and angrier, says, my kid could do that. And that's how he looks at it. He'd rather go to a Yankees game. That's how museums are meant to be. They're, they are the, um, 
that term coined in the 60s, they're the, uh, the sanctuaries of the atheist, the sanctuaries of the non-believers. Um, this, is, this hasn't always been the case. 130 years ago, more people knew artists than they knew actors. Um, that's largely due to the way information was given out, but um, buying a photo of an actor didn't get you anywhere, so although they were collected, you could have a reproduction of a Turner painting in your house, you could have a reproduction of most artists, and so artists were very important. Uh, they, they were followed in the news like you would follow um, any pop star today. I don't know, I can't come up with a simple one. No Gibson. Like they're followed like No Gibson does things. I don't know. Something. <laughs> Um, but but when they went to court, it was widely publicized. Um, you know, when uh, Turner was brought it, uh, took John Ruskin, the critic, to trial, this is like the most publicized thing in London at the time. Um, people followed it every day, trying to figure out if Turner was going to win this lawsuit of libel against a critic. Uh, that never happens. Artists now only make headlines if they offend everyone and cause an art controversy, which those don't happen that much anymore because. Uh, it's hard to offend people now, and or if they sell work for an idiot amount that makes everyone go, how did someone spend sixty million dollars on a painting? Uh, those are the two headlines that you get in the art world now: uh, stupid amounts of money or I offended everyone. Um, which we have a lecture on, or I'm going to try to do a lecture on controversial art at some point. So we'll get more into that. Um, Art affects culture secondhand. Um, I don't think that's a controversial statement. Everyone knows that. Um, usually the art we see is usually through a medium of someone we actually know. Uh, an artist who absurdly does this is Kanye West. Um, every album he's done has taken like a very big deal artist that, not, that isn't widely accepted and uses him. Um, his album Homecoming used the Takashi Murakami painting. Um, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy used a painting by George Kondo, who just is having his big retrospective at the Met, I think. One of those big museums. So um, that's how we're hearing about it. Or like Lady Gaga. Um, you look at photos of the things Lady Gaga is doing to her body, um, and you see artists who are working with the body, like Orlan or uh, or, or different people in that, and she's actually borrowing, she's not just appropriating, she's straight up stealing things that visual artists are doing, but no one knows that these visual artists exist and no one cares, so when she does it, it's a new thing. Um, that's how marginalized the high in art world is, that you can straight up steal things, and if you're Kanye West, it's the first time anyone's done it. So um, that's how much, how important it is. Uh, in his, uh, his video, um, Runaway, that he did, speak, going back to Kanye. Vanessa Beercroft, that whole video, he even brought her on to help with the project. That whole video was a Vanessa Beercroft reference, and everyone thought Kanye was a genius, and maybe he is. So, art affects everything secondhand now. Which makes for some interesting, uh, where are we? Oh, the... Uh, that's the new irascibles, by the way. The photograph, the irascibles, you guys can kind of pass that around. Like, every 20 years now, because that was so iconic, photographers take that model and try to establish the new irascibles. So that picture is like the dealers. Um, uh, Timothy Greenfield Sanders um, went around and took photos of the dealers, the collectors, the critics, and the artists, and then tried to kind of make them something by grouping them together. And a photographer just did this like four years ago, making the, the new, new irascibles. So it's kind of this thing to follow. Um, that's neither here nor there. Um, getting back to it, since art is so marginalized, that affects a lot of art. You're looking at art that is now just trying to get the public's opinion, which is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, artists didn't have to deal with that in the Renaissance. Artists didn't have to deal with that even as Impressionists or post-Impressionists. People would come to the museums and the galleries and look at their work. Now you're dealing with artists. Um, the, next the next slide, the next image, 
uh, is a piece by Felix Gonzalez Torres done in 1991. He started taking out billboards. He started renting billboards and showing his works of art through there because he knew that was one of the only ways he could reach a large audience. So that's a piece he did. Um, it's a really beautiful piece. In the 90s, it wasn't popular to talk about love, but all of his work was about love, which was um, thought naive. But that photo is just, I, I think, really clever. It's just a bed, and you see the imprints of two people laying next to each other without the people there anymore. His work was also a comment on AIDS, so the fact that they're not there is um, two people he knew who died, or the absence of uh, love is kind of what he's referencing. Um, you have artists who are taking work out of the museums, or when they're allowed to be in museums, are trying to get the public to come into them. So that's a movement called, uh, that this, or that's an ideology that's been taken up a lot by uh, the relational aesthetic movement. Um, it's kind of led by Rick Rick Terabinia, who's a uh, professor at Columbia now. But his whole thing is he cooks for people, and that's kind of the high-end art world is he, uh, when people come to a museum exhibit or a gallery show, the exhibit is a just cooks for them. Um, he makes some food, there's nothing to buy, there's nothing to sell, there's nothing to take away from it. Um, museums try to like take the cups he puts it in and sell it, and he thinks that's like hilarious. Like there's, there's, like, there's nothing to it. Rippert's work is he feeds people. And, um, and there are other artists doing kind of similar things. But it's art that's engaging the public and making the public extraordinarily important to the understanding of the work of art. Um, so that's something that's kind of good uh, from, a, from a negative thing uh, with art being relegated to the second, third, or any tertiary tier of society. Um, it's forcing artists to think of ways to make the public important. Um, you're getting large social projects from artists. Art, uh, projects, uh, I forget the artist's name, but her she's a relational aesthetic Statistician. Um, and she invited every ice cream cart truck in England to all meet in an open field and invited every uh, elementary school in the neighborhood to come out and just have ice cream. So it was like she was trying to make like the utopia heaven for children of like every kind of ice cream in this open field all over, the, all over England. Everyone, you know, like these kids were just shocked at seeing like 800 kinds of ice cream trucks, each with their own kinds of ice cream. So um, it's things that are involving the people, and also things you can't buy, which is um, kind of an important part to it. Um, any questions about that? Or I continue on, take a breath. Um, all right, uh, to sum it up very simplistically, um, there are three basic ideologies that have happened philosophically in the last hundred years that uh, art plays into as well. And I would argue that's historicism, modernism, and postmodernism. Um, there's a ton of work written on each one of those. I'm butchering them by running through this in five minutes. So please take the time if you're interested in these ideas to uh, go after them further. I can give you kind of like a, a reading list of people you can um, follow more. But starting off, historicism. Um, these are people who believe that the answer to everything existed 100 years ago. Um, when they're presented with a problem, they're usually very reactionary. They're usually the grumpy people who are saying, when I was five, uh, milk only cost a nickel. You know, <laughs> like uh, That's a typical historicist thing to say. So within art, you're getting people who are going, the best kind of art was this rubbish would never fly when I was a kid. Rembrandt was a great painter, wow. Um, not to pick on them, but the Tea Party movement. They usually fall into this general thing of being historicists. The answer to everything is a constitution. Even though the constitution believed black people were three-fifths of a person, and the constitution was written with no understanding of what a nuclear bomb could do, or what the internet meant, we should always refer back to a document written 200 years ago for our answers for now. And that is their staunch, we have to look to the past. Because our society is built on um, history being a very important thing. So it makes sense that rather than trying to solve new problems that are scary and crazy, you should look to Benjamin Franklin and what he would have done in this situation. Even though there's no evidence of what he would have done. 
Um, or maybe there is. But that's what historicists do. So historicists, you ask them what their favorite artwork was, and they will tell you um, Leonardo da Vinci or uh, people of that nature, which is fine. Uh, but they, they're still great. But there's newer, there, there are newer dialogues going on, newer conversations happening since Leonardo da Vinci. As crazy as it is to understand, he was dealing with a different world than we are dealing with. Um, so that's historicism. Um, modernism, um, mo the term modern uh, was coined by uh, Baudelaire in the 1840s. It started off as a literary movement, kind of branching off of Romanticism. Um, it didn't, I would argue it didn't take hold uh, in art until the late 19th century. Um, after Impressionism, really post-Impressionism, where art for the first time was allowed to get away from the academy and, uh, and be free of representation and free of uh, the academy or the institution. Um, so you're looking at the Impressionists. Before that, uh, the, the um, systems where distinction is conferred, as you would say, was the Salon and the Royal Academy. Um, if you didn't make it into the Royal Academy, you were an artist uh, in Western art. If you didn't make it into the Salon, you were an artist. Um, if you did art and you weren't those things, no one cared. Absolutely across the board. The Impressionists were kicked out of the Academy and didn't make it into the Salons and started doing this art that um, just blew people's minds for that time. As hard as it has to believe, now Impressionism reminds me of my grandmother's quilting. Um, but at one point, uh, like a, a critic wrote that the Impressionists, you shouldn't go to the Impressionist show if you're pregnant because it's so bad you might lose a baby um, and it might kill something inside of you, just seeing how awful this artwork is. Which again, we're talking about Impressionism, which it's hard to get that, but that's how crazy it was back then, like for something to not look like a person, for something to like not look exactly as it's supposed to look. After the Impressionists, you have the post-Impressionists like Van Gogh, Gauguin, were more interested in expressing the inner rather than making something look like something. There's not a single person in the whole world, I hope, that looks like Edward, uh, Edvard Munch's The Scream. Um, I hope no one looks like that, uh, it, but that's not important. It captures an emotion, and that was the first time that art was really allowed to do that um, in the Western art world, maybe since cave painting. That's probably the last time. Um, so uh, art for the first time was allowed to focus on the inner self. Artists were allowed to have some kind of autonomy and, and make decisions on how they wanted to represent something. And uh, also they didn't have to play with these stupid symbols, um, which was a lot of what the Royal Academy was about, was including a skull and a still life and including you know, these three leaves representing antiquity and all that stuff. It was all these things you had to learn um, and know and be on the inside of because every theoretical meaning had one solution. Um, but modernism really took hold and modernism's greatest gift to history is abstraction, which was a necessary next step, which began in the early 20th century. Um, and uh, Abstraction as it started was um, a lot different than abstraction now. A lot of the abstract uh, artists back then really believed if you understood abstract art, you would start moving towards utopia. Um, or you'd start, uh, Pierre Mondrian believed that if you could get his work, that there wouldn't be crime anymore. Um, that there wouldn't be uh, people stealing from each other or murder or anything. That all you'd do is understand his painting and everyone would live in harmony. Um, so that's a very fun, naive worldview that I don't know of any artists who have that anymore. Um, but that was kind of modernism. Modernism had uh, believed in personal expression. They believed that each mar artist had their own distinct mark that was only theirs. That artists were just trying to learn what made their work the, their work. And that each artist had a, had a specific signature that was unmistakable to anyone else but them. Um, and that when they established that, the audience couldn't do anything but have a very visceral reaction to this work and fall in love with it. Um, again, all, this, all kind of modernist ideas that each person is, 
a beautiful individual snowflake, and every person has something to offer society. Um, modernists believe in the linear timeline. They believe everything is moving towards perfection. Um, they believe that uh, Hegel uh, was a philosopher that kind of defined modernism for better or worse, and he believed in an idea called synthesis, um, which believed he took two ideas, merged them together to make a better idea, which then merged with another idea to make a better idea, to make a better idea, that every so many years you were constantly moving towards something, that everything was making more sense, that you took two political systems like communism and, um, and uh, democracy, you, you merged them, eventually those two would merge into something better than either one of those two parts, which would then merge with something else as well. Um, so that's kind of uh, a, a view that a lot of people would argue is completely naive um, now. Uh, people don't believe that, uh, that art is that, or that, that time works that way. Um, the bit, the, <laughs> hey, we have a microwave. Thank you very much. We have a microwave at the pharmacy, that's awesome. I want to get something up. Um, uh, everything's moving towards something. Everything makes sense. These are ideas that modernists still hold to. Um, they're trying to make sense of everything through metaphor, through allegory. They believe in signs. They believe that if something happens in the universe, it's for a reason. Um, but then World War I happened. Um, and it kind of uh, uh, peeing everyone's Cheerios, for lack of a better term. Everyone was super excited that everything was getting better, and then everyone dragged each other into a war. Millions of people were slaughtered and killed for no reason, really, because some archduke was killed. And modernists really uh, let a lot of air out of their balloon. But then they got really excited again, because they survived it. And then World War II happened, and the same thing happened. Like, 30 years later, they didn't learn from anything. Once again, everyone got dragged into a war over Germany invading Poland because of leftover issues from World War I. And once again, everyone's like, man, that's, uh, life doesn't work that, that well, I guess. Um, and uh, so a lot of just disappointment happened to longness. And then they got over that, and America was clearly the victor, and Adolf Hitler, Nazis, and people who represented pure evil were dead. And then we got involved in Vietnam, which no one walked away from the winner. Um, so, but modernists still try to find meaning in all that and still try to think that we're all still moving towards utopia, which is a purely modernist belief. If you believe in utopia, you have some kind of modernist in you, that things are getting better and that the state government, um, or that the government, uh, politics, technology, it's all moving towards a better society that 200 years from now, we'll all be better off for it. Um, I have a picture in there, um, going back to the sheet, it's uh, to kind of try to, I, I feel like the architecture within these movements kind of sum it up actually really well, um, and that's a plaza in Chicago, and on the left is uh, the Marina City, um, in the middle is the IBM Plaza, and on the right is the Trump Tower, and that kind of um, gets a lot of movements out of the way, the middle uh, being modernism, Architecture within modernism was very straightforward. Um, it believed in no distinctive marks. It believed that everything kind of served the greater good, that every business office should look the same as every other business office. There shouldn't be the corner office that's bigger than everyone else. So you end up with a lot of these giant black slabs of, of architecture from modernism. On the right is Trump Tower, which is a little bit more postmodern. Um, the architect is kind of having more of his signature and everything. Um, and and uh, postmodernist art architecture believes in uh, making like a one-stop go for where you're going. The business office is also a place where you hang out. It's also a place where you have uh, ping pong tables and pool. It's also a place where you have a food court um, that represent foods from all over the world. It's a place where you can have a daycare. It's a place where you can um, watch movies. Like that's the postmodern idea of architecture is trying to make these buildings that aren't specifically one overall overarching purpose, but are every purpose for everyone. Um, and modernism believes that 
you don't want flair, and historicists believe you need to make things look like they came from Rome. So neoclassical was historicism, um, which I still don't get. Um, but whatever. Beautiful work. Um, so then last, not least, the thing we're probably going to talk about the most, which influences art the most, it is not the overarching idea, but it is probably the largest idea is postmodernism within art in the last 30 years. Um, the, the, the last, the greatest hurrah of modernists were the abstract expressionists in the 60s, that photo of mostly white men. Um, that was their, their, their shining glory. Uh, male macho art, um, de Kooning, who had a ridiculous amount of lovers, um, other than his wife. They were all people who drank, they were all alcoholics for the most part, and they all got to do whatever they wanted to within the art world. They established New York as a major art center. Um, and uh, that was kind of the last hurrah of uh, modernism, and then things got uh, a little bit crazier, because postmodernists believe that there is no absolute truth. They believe there's no one meaning. They believe that um, they don't believe in high culture and low culture. They believe that, uh, they, and they definitely don't believe in a linear timeline. I think to simplify it all, uh, modernists and postmodernists, the best way to tell the difference between them is the way they look at time. A modernist believes that time is moving forward and making more sense. A postmodernist believes that every generation is remaking the same mistakes as the one before it. That Time is really just this one big cyclical thing. We're not getting better. We're also probably not getting worse because those definitions really don't mean anything. Um, we're just existing and not getting, not moving at all. Um, it's something that postmodernists would kind of hold on to. Um, a really simple analogy. If a historicist sees a person on the street begging for food, a historicist's answer would probably be, Back when I was a kid, there weren't poor people, um, and they'd walk away. Um, a modernist would look at them and go, let me help you and get you to you know, the state. Let me make you a ward of the state. They will feed you, they will clothe you, they will make you better, they will turn you out, you will be a better person for it. The, the answer is in the political systems and the foundations that are here to help you. The postmodernist would look at them and say, what am I saying that this person needs help? Maybe they're better off than I am. Um, this person doesn't have food, but I'm in an awful marriage, and I hate my wife, and so maybe he should be helping me. Who am I to say that I'm important enough to help this person? Um, that's a very that's an oversimplification, but that's one I'm going to use. So, um, any any questions about historicism, modernism, postmodernism, overly simplified? Any anything? Any, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I want to take a quick breath. Um, Postmodernists are all about the avant-garde. They're about uh, new territory. The avant-garde uh, is a term probably most of you know, um, but I think it's interesting. It's actually a, a military formation that it's based off of, and it was uh, a military formation where you had your soldiers that you didn't like the most run forward into the battle as far as they possibly could, getting shot at, um, get as far forward as they could, lay down flat, and then the armies would catch up to them, stand on their backs, and shoot. And so you have someone shooting on the ground, someone shooting on top of them. Um, but they were the people you sent running into full steam into the, a lot of people died. So the avant-garde movement within art is uh, this kind of glorification of what avant-garde artists are doing. They're taking the bullets, they're taking the criticism, they're taking people hating them, um, but they're doing it in the name of art and they're moving the frontier further. Um, so that's the avant-garde kind of ethos or, or ideology or zeitgeist or whatever. Um, within the last 20 years, I would argue the best go-to um, for postmodern art for the avant-garde is kitsch. Um, kitsch is like the most important thing artists can hold on to because it's something that um, artists try to stay away from, for all of art history. Uh, artists were trying to distance themselves from tchotchkes and little uh, $3 items and different things like that. Um, 
and trying to make the clear distinction. Clement Greenberg, the foremost I talked about, the, the critic, warned against it. He said, you can't, like, artists have to fight against kitsch, they have to fight against low culture, otherwise all culture will fall apart. Um, and he's maybe right, because um, he didn't live long enough to see what's going on now. Um, Andy Warhol happened uh, in the 60s, and uh, really loved the quotidian object, or the everyday object. Um, one of his major quotes was, uh, I'd rather go to a supermarket than a museum, which kind of summed up his feelings on culture, which is true. More people are affected by supermarkets and grocery stores and care more about what they see there than they do about a museum. Um, he painted Campbell's soup cans. You know, right now, it, uh, I could rattle off 50 artists and what you think of and what I think of when I say those things are different. Um, you might not know all of them, and I might not know all the artists you're talking about. But if you say, what does uh, a corn pop cereal box look like? Most of you would know that. Um, so it does affect culture largely, and Warhol believed that should be um, really built into did the Brillo boxes um, and started trying to take the grocery store, the supermarket, into the museum. Um, Clement Greenberg hated that uh, and tried to get his uh, his posse or his followers, Pollock and de Kooning, to kind of uh, do good enough art that blasted Warhol out of the out of the art world. Uh, it didn't work. Um, it took more hold. Um, I think I said everything I want to say about that. It's the greatest motivator. The next image on your on your sheets. I'm sorry, I'll speed up looking at images. This first part is just laying out definitions. Um, is uh, Jeff Koons Rabbit, uh, which was made in 1986. Uh, he, he took a, a blow-up doll, or a blow-up, um, like I think it's like a pool, a blow-up pool thing, but it, uh, or it's, it's used in this place. It's a, it's a rabbit that's like a blow-up balloon with a carrot, and he recast it in gold and silver and sold them for money that would make all this mad hearing the number for it. Um, because he was really interested, he was lumped into a category, he was his own artist, but there are other artists who were interested in this in the 80s, of commodification, of what makes um, materials interesting to culture and take on, like what, why we have to own every Beanie Baby, you know, why we have to collect everything, why we have to buy this or buy that, or why this car is, establishes class and this car doesn't, you know. Um, we, we are made, uh, we were born into a culture that uh, initiates in all of us a need to collect and a need to commodify objects. And so uh, Jeff Koons was a part of a group called the Commodity Kids, or that's what some people coined them. They took everyday items going off of Warhol and uh, glammed them to the point that they were million dollar objects, covering them in gold or platinum or silver. Um, it was kind of a, a, a quick comment. On, uh, on that, but you also have artists, uh, next to that is Raymond Pettibon, um, an untitled piece from 1982. Um, he, kind of going off of what uh, Lichtenstein was doing before him, his whole period are these uh, kind of poorly drawn comic books um, that uh, he, he, he did in the 80s. Uh, so he's referencing bad newspaper, I mean they look like they were confusing this like, uh, um, I guess uh, uh, this imagery that, um, is very radical. I'm sorry, my mind's going. Um, taking it further, 2002, Layla Ali, who's right next to that, she is taking the cartoon further. I really like Layla Ali's work. Um, from what I understand, she doesn't anymore, but that's kind of a, a downside to artists. Um, I got to hear her speak. And uh, she feels like she's stuck in a rut, but her galleries don't want her to change her style, so she's doing this forever. She's over it, though, and was 10 years ago. But they're really interesting little pieces. Um, they're gouache on paper. Um, she makes these cartoons that you can't tell what the gender is, you can't tell what the race is. Um, they're, they're characters, they're cartoon, and they're all right before or right after horrendous um, acts of violence. Um, so there are these kind of cute, cartoony things that are uh, reflective of 
how quickly our culture devolves in violence, um, which is what a lot of her work is about. Check it out if you get the chance. Uh, I really like Leila Ali. Um, and then right next to that, I have two pieces by Murakami, which is further kind of exemplifying high culture and low culture mixing. Takashi Murakami is the artist in the world right now. If you leave this forgetting everything I said, which you probably will, which is fine, I don't care. Um, I expect you to. The one artist you should walk away remembering is Takashi Murakami. He is the guy. Um, he makes more money than anyone else right now. His work is bought by collectors all over the world. And this whole thing is he he's a Japanese artist and he, represent he references anime. Um, anime and manga. Uh, so context is really important with Takashi Murakami because these are things that like, if they were in a comic book, would be worth two dollars. But the fact that Murakami's doing it in a major museum or a major gallery means they're worth astronomical prices. Um, so there's that painting. Um, he's also kind of into, again, commodification, which is a lot, a lot of artists are into. He created this character named Dob, who kind of looks like Mickey Mouse, but has really sharp teeth, and um, is in these environments of, of uh, violence, at, at times violent, at times horrific, abject, scary, um, and he's kind of this passive, adver uh, passive observer to all of it, but also within this culture. His name's Dob, I forget what it stands for, but you see it on his ear, the D, his head is the O, and then his other ear is the B. Um, He's this made-up cartoon character that he sells t-shirts of and, and sells uh, sculptures of and paintings of. And he's trying to do something that Shepard Fairey also did in the 1980s, which is market an item that doesn't exist um, or create a character to market or run with. That's kind of a popular art idea. So uh, Dob is this made-up um, uh, Mickey Mouse or Bugs Bunny or whatever, but kind of messed up and violent and blood splattered and covered in crazy colors and, and um, I mean you're like the sweet tooth in you really just loses it like it's so high key color uh, it makes me see rainbows in kind of a bad way um, so that's something Murakami's doing and then there's that sculpture that's straight out of an anime thing of a woman cyborg which if you know anime that's something a lot of um, Japanese people are kind of into, like objectifying, sexualizing women, making them part cyborg for whatever reason, or part giant robot, and having laser beams shoot out, and, and he's kind of commenting on that. But again, it's context. Context is very important. Because um, it's important because he's showing it in the right place, and it's being done by him and not an anime artist. Um, he works four years out now, which is insane. Uh, he's that backed up on selling and making installations and making sculptures. Um, so, uh, any questions on that? And then we'll get into like kind of the final leg of it. Do we need a break? We take a break too. Do you need a break? I'm fine, but we can take a break. That's totally fine with me. That is kind of a good stopping point. We can kind of get into specifically 1980 to now definitions. Can we do that? All right, thank you. Of writing that I struggled with, with, with the language poets, and it's very much this idea of that you know, I read their work and it's words, but I understand the words, but when they're all put together, it's just like I cannot penetrate what, you know, right. what, the, what they're saying, yes. and they don't care. It's very much like mm -hmm. you know, people who get it, get it, people who don't really care about what people, right? So, I'm wondering with the um, with the high end artists, is it is it the artists who have the attitude that, like, or is it the dealers and the who, who is it that has to approach to, I don't care if people get it or not? Because I always feel like I think the art is about communicating. And once, you, right. once you're uninterested in that aspect of it, I kind of am interested in, you know, that thought process. It's, uh, I would say it's case by case, but largely, I think, with some exceptions, I think artists, for the most part, um, want people to like their work. Right. Uh, to some degree, and even if they they say they don't, they probably do. They want to be well received. That's like an artist's nature. Um, or just to get some sort of reaction. Right. Yeah. They get some kind of reaction. Um, there are artists, you know, who kind of start working in the 70s mm -hmm. who were kind of purposely trying to punch people in the face with their art. Mm -hmm. And um, the 70s almost killed artwork, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm not even joking. Like, music. And... Right. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, 
like literally this like the people thought art wouldn't make it in the 80s because the 70s was that bad. Uh, no one used color for like all 10 years of that. It was all black and white paintings of text. That was a lot of what it was. So like on Kawara and people, and who wants to go to a museum to look at black and white paintings of words? Like no one wants that. So like the 70s almost killed everything. Other than that though, uh, artists I think um, would like people to be involved. Um, I think it's mostly the critics and curators and people of that nature who just don't, um, I don't think it's like necessarily elitism, I think it's more that they just don't want to speak to the median. Like they, they're hoping that people catch up to where they are. They see themselves as kind of purveying culture or like carrying culture in the future. Mm -hmm. So for them, they're hoping that like people take the time to learn what they're saying rather than like going to the median um, and like the, I guess that's kind of, they look at themselves kind of as like the high priests of culture, I guess. Um, so I'd say, I'd say even, even the, like they are mean or, or evil people or uh, I'd say most of the time, some of them are elitist and bad, but, um, <laughs> but you know, a lot of them are just uh, very educated people and they expect, you know, some of the educated people to read what they, you know, if you pick up their magazine, you would only want to do that if you have some interest in what they're writing about. I mean, Freeze is like all essays. It's, uh, and it's all, I mean, uh, Robert Storr, who's like the president of Columbia, usually submits a few things. Like, it, you know, it's all Ivy League, uh, and it's essays really concerned with kind of what's going on. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers it. There's some people who are jerks, but I'd say over the most part, they just, you know, they, they're hoping people take the time to catch up to them. Right. So, uh, um, you know, Chris? I just wonder, at least your opinion, what do you think takes a piece of art that could be relatively obscure? Because, you know, there's nothing necessarily, at least in certain opinions, special about it. Mm -hmm. uh, like the screen, yeah. What takes that from you know obscurity into pop culture icon? It's uh, it's it's that that phrase um, systems of uh, I was butchered it. Systems of reception where distinction are conferred. It's um, it's a lot of things. It's a lot of you know. It's um, the right art critic at the time being like, hey, we should all go back and look at the screen. You know, it's the right um, taste. It's the you know uh, the screen. Uh, for instance, just, I mean, I know that you're not asking specifically about that, but the screen was really big because it was. Uh, summing up what a lot of people were feeling at the time where they're starting to lose their own personal voice. So it started to get into that kind of, even though it wasn't existentialism yet, it was starting to get into like, I feel this way, I don't have any agency in this world, I can't operate anything. Like, because of the um, industrialization of Europe, like, I am just a cog in a machine, um, you know, or, uh, um, and, and so. That, that's where that came from, so it kind of typified a larger spirit. So I'd say a lot of times that's what it is, is like it's work that kind of embodies something a lot of people resonate. But like I said with branding, um, sometimes it's the right person buying the work, sometimes it's the right dealer selling the work, sometimes it's the right museum showing the work. It's just, it's, it's a number of factors. And that's, for me that's kind of what, why I wanted to try to give these lectures um, is because a lot of people look at the high end art world and it's, it is really spread out. There is no like, you're a college basketball player and then you become an NBA player and then you become an MVP of your team. You know, like there is no one trek to it. You know, for every one artist who makes it because they went to Yale um, and, and, you know, won the Turner Prize and, you know, got this grant, there's another artist who's just as well known, who, like Basquiat, Basquiat didn't even go to school, um, you know, and his work was discovered just fine. So there is no one linear path, there are a lot of, but there are things where like, whoever wins this grant is a big deal now, you know. Um, the, I, I think the biggest thing for an American artist, for the biggest flavor to catch it, is the, uh, the Whitney Biennial. Um, 
the Whitney has a has a show. If you're in the Whitney Biennial, your career is established. Like as like it takes emerging artists who no one knows about, and by being in that show, people know you. Like you, your phone's ringing off the hook to to uh, be in someone's gallery. Um, and they and they're they're very crafty about it. Jerry Saltz, one of the, probably the biggest critic, he he oversees a lot of the decisions behind that. Um, and from what I understand, uh, they send critics all over the country. Um, you find out like a week before if they want to look at your work. They show up to your studio. They talk to you for an hour, and you find out if you're if you're good enough for it. Um, some artists here have that happen to them four or five times before it finally takes. And so uh, they send it. They usually send a team. I mean, obviously New York, obviously LA. They usually send a team to Chicago, sometimes Seattle and Santa Fe. And uh, and then if someone's really special, they go out of their way to find them. Um, but uh, that the Whitney Biennial is kind of the big establishing thing I know of. And there are some residencies that are really big. The Andy Warhol Foundation has one in New York City that takes people who are, for the most part, pretty young, gives them a foundation where for like, I think, a year, you get free studio space. And that launches a lot of careers. Um, so for me, like, I, I just hope people in general don't get overwhelmed. Like, these things exist. There are things that you can read about and be like, oh, these are the people in the Whitney Biennial. Like, they have been established to be important, you know? Like, um, they are worth my time to understand why they've been established to be important. Um, so yeah, anything else, any other questions? Or should we jump back into it maybe? All right. Um, when does contemporary art begin? The 1980s. Um, maybe. I'm going to say the 1980s for the purpose of this lecture, uh, just because it makes life easier for me. And my arguments for that, um, New York City is less important. You've got the reemergence of other art uh, world powers that are international. Uh, London comes back into it. Um, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Johannesburg. Uh, Berlin, you have art centers all over the world popping up, which to me is kind of something that establishes as a contemporary, uh, makes it all make sense together. Um, postmodernism really taking hold. Um, no one person is completely postmodernist, no one person is completely modernist. We all reflect different things on what day that we, you talk to us. There are days where I'm like, get off my lawn, things were better when I was six. You know, like, uh, you know, so that's, that's just everyone. Um, but postmodernism post is the prevailing ideology right now, as since the 1980s. Um, second generation feminism, which in the feminism lecture we'll get into more of what that means, but just to sum up really quickly, first generation feminism um, believe doing to them what they've done to us. Um, so women were taking um, Taking imagery where women were objectified in art history, and they were oftentimes replacing the women who were concubines of prostitutes with men, uh, naked men who were concubines of prostitutes. Or the first generation feminists were trying to objectify men as much as they had been objectified throughout our history. Second generation feminism, which started kind of taking form in the 1980s, was about reclamation. It didn't care about men anymore, it was about taking. Um, taking things that were notoriously um, not theirs anymore and taking it back. Um, you see this a lot uh, with uh, body reclamation, you know, like uh, Britney Spears, like when she had a big meltdown. Like, I think it says a lot of the first thing she did was shave her head. Um, she made herself uh, not um, digestible to the public. So in a way, she's taking back her own body and trying to show that she had ownership of it. If she wanted to shave her head, she could. Um, that was kind of the second generation feminist thing to do, was like, um, this is my body. I don't have to be beautiful for you. Like, I can do whatever I want. If I want a tattoo on my face, I'm going to do that. Um, you know, and, and this is, and, and taking things that were typically not theirs anymore, like beauty, which I've kind of labored, but um, also uh, 
you know, uh, things that they that were used to kind of hold them in and generalize them. They were taking those things and, and reclaiming them for themselves. Um, so that second generation feminism, which started catching up in the 1980s, um, monumental photography uh, started happening because of improvements in technology. You could have huge photographs, uh, which uh, you know Cindy Sherman, uh, Jeff Wall, a lot of photographers started taking advantage of. And for a while, I don't think this worked out, but for a while, people were talking about photography completely replacing painting. Uh, that painting, everyone thinks painting's going to die every five years. That's just, across the board, everyone's waiting for painting to die. And it makes theoretical sense why everyone thinks that, but it's never happened. Um, as I said earlier, Ad Reinhardt back in the 60s was quoted as saying, I'm just making the last paintings anyone can ever do. Well, obviously, people were still doing paintings, um, which probably makes Ad Reinhardt a little bit frustrated, but it's okay. Um, and uh, but people really thought photography was taking over and was going to replace painting completely because while painters were trying to find themselves in the 80s and were trying to um, kind of take out the narrative in their work, trying to destroy all history in painting, trying to you know um, destroy objecthood and all these different things that made it really uh, un unpalatable um, to people. Photography was like just getting into it. They were like starting the game fresh, like they were straight off the bench. Because like now they could have huge photographs, which meant they could reference history painting. Like they could reference these huge full wall uh, narrative scenes. Like, um, you know, like all these things that artists or that painters worked out back in the 1800s and killed and beat, you know, beat the dead horse uh, and, and did all that. Uh, photographers, because of technology finally catching up, could now start reworking those problems in a really fresh way. So a lot of people, uh, so it got a lot of currency, a lot of people thought that meant photography is going to continue. Um, there are essays in these books I also have um, that you can read. Uh, one's called, one's by Howard Halley, it's called Photo and Realism. It talks about uh, the photographer Thomas Struth. Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, Thomas Struth is the other German. Um, Hmm. I'll, get, I'll get to you. It's not Tomas Truth. Um, it talks about photography literally in those ways. It talks about how the photography is replacing history painting. The photography understands the history of painting better than painting understands the history of painting. And it is going to make painting go the way of the dinosaur, uh, which is something people believe in the 80s. Uh, another one, Douglas Kirk, The End of Painting. Same thing. He believed painting was over because photography was coming into existence. Um, so those are two essays that are kind of interesting to see is why people believe these things. Um, it makes you understand the 80s a lot better uh, because everyone um, believed these things. Um, people believe painting is going to die at any time because it doesn't make sense anymore um, from a very practical level. Um, we live in a society, obviously, that's mediated by tons of images. We're inundated by screens. We see a YouTube video for 30 seconds and we switch it to another one and everything's constantly moving. So why would you have a non-moving work that never changes on your wall forever? Like that doesn't carry well into our culture. And so everyone sees it as like eventually no one's going to care about painting anymore because it doesn't reflect our times. And all contemporary art should reflect the times. So we see now with a lot of painters as critics who only give them any kind of uh, credence if uh, the painter is being really snarky about it. Um, they're painting to show how stupid painting is, um, which happens, um, they're, or they're painting meta painting to reference how dead painting is. Um, so that's kind of, but, but people thought painting was going to die in the 70s, they thought it was going to die in the 90s, now they're thinking it's going to die again, it will probably continue on. Um, and if you go into a museum, most museums, and actually most galleries still mostly show paintings. It's still like the, you know, everyone picks on it, it's still what galleries like to have on their walls. Like installations is like the hot new thing, or building site specific work. But galleries would rather have something on the walls too, and that's right now painting. So um, it's still got a little bit of a while, I think. But uh, 
The 80s, everyone was convinced it was dead. Um, post minimalists in the 1970s, Donald Judd, different people like that, uh, kind of changed up um, the work. And uh, the uh, concepts and conceptual theory about the end of painting, as I already said, and the end of history. Um, a lot of writing is being about, written about the end of history, which everyone believes to be different things. Some believe that we're to the last stages of uh, politics, that there is no politi new political system that can be made. Um, there is no, you know, now communism has been reported to be a failure by a lot of people. Now it's only democracy and only variations of that. So people think that, that means it's the end of history. Um, or the end of marketing history, which, you know, whether or not that's true or not, that's just, that's one thing people argue for the end of history, and um, there are countless other things. Um, postmodern, or, uh, yeah, postmodernists also believe it just because, like I said, they believe in cyclical time, so they believe we're just rehatching everything. So what's the point of documenting everything? Uh, because we're just falling for the same problems, and, um, and also, they just believe the way history is being written down and, and mediated is represented. So these are all um, reasons. Uh, I included a photo in the packet, for those of you who still have that. Um, it's a photo of the destruction of the Pruitt Igo building in St. Louis. This happened in 1972. Um, Carl Yanks, a uh, postmodern philosopher, post-structuralist philosopher, believed this was the, this was the moment postmodernism began. Um, which is a pretty big statement, but actually a lot of people kind of were on board with it. Uh, the Prodigo buildings were a very modernist idea. Um, they were made by Minoru Yamasaki, uh, who also made the World Trade Center. Fortunately, he had a bad uh, reputation, I guess, in making buildings that were destroyed. Um, poor guy. Uh, but he uh, made these buildings, and it was uh, St. Louis's uh, catch-all problem solved. They thought it was really going to work. Um, you build these low-income housing uh, giant structures. Like I said with modernism, no distinctive marks, just a big giant stacked on stacked on stacked houses. Low-income housing, anyone can afford it, everyone moves in, and um, they save money on housing so then they can use that to put their kids through school, to um, become better, to you know, buy their community and, and take programs. That didn't work. Um, and that doesn't really work, as most people know. Um, now we call these things projects, uh, where um, Pruitt-Igoe, within five years of it being built, was notorious for violence, um, drug use, um, and, and was, cops were afraid to go to it because, ironically, the structure and grid of it made it impossible to tell where someone was shooting from because everything looked the same. So. Cops wouldn't go to it to try to solve problems, so it just became violence, crime-infested uh, buildings. And 1972, they destroyed it, even though it was built um, in 1956, so it wasn't up very long. Um, imploding it was kind of the end of modernism, as some people believe, because modernists really believe this could change things. Like, if you gave people a chance, they would use that to, again, put your kids through school, uh, form communities, get better, get off drugs, do different things. And people watched as people took advantage of that. They didn't use their money they saved to help anyone. They used it to buy more drugs and more guns and kill each other. So, um, again, the air being let out of the balloon um, and modernists uh, watch as these buildings were destroyed, and now they're replaced by a very postmodernist idea, which is um, scattered housing of different uh, income levels. And uh, you see this uh, in Cabrini Greens up in Chicago. Um, that was the same situation. Now Cabrini Greens, for the, I think it's two years ago, finally completely destroyed. It had been kind of destroyed in parts, and now it's all low rise. Uh, no skyscrapers, low-income housing to mid-income housing, you know, and, and kind of scattering up different things. Um, so, beginning of postmodernism, maybe. Um, uh, so this failure of modernism begins at contemporary age. Um, postmodernism, post-structuralism, and other theories spring from the failures of formalism, modernism, and the ideologies of Clement Greenberg. Um, Postmodernism is covered by a lot of philosophers uh, who are usually also labeled post-structuralists, which we'll get into, like Leotard, Foucault, Baudrillard, Derrida, um, 
Umberto Eco, Carl Yanks. Um, a lot of people are uh, dealing with postmodernism. It's better to read them than listen to me talk about them. I'm simplifying everything. Um, they were, uh, like I said, uh, postmodernists were opposed to the linear timeline. They didn't believe everything was getting better. They believed that um, human beings were made to take advantage of things. Um, they didn't believe in black and white or dualism. Um, you know, this is right, this is wrong, this, you know, uh, this is male, this is female. That alterity or that binary thinking doesn't exist to a postmodernist. There is no distinction between people. There's no distinction between right and wrong. Um, all things are kind of a gray area that changes by context, by the person doing it, and um, everything is uh, inherent to the, the person participating. There is no general rule that sums us all up. Um, they're anti-elitist, obviously, because they're employing kitsch. They're employing the things. Postmodernists typically um, try to figure out what the generation before them are telling them not to do, and they do it. Um, that's what artists have been doing the last 30 years. Uh, Chuck Close started doing hyper-realism because he was told he should be an abstract expressionist. And so instead of Willem de Kooning, who's, you know, doing whatever he wants to, making this heroic images and painting, Chuck Close and making things that look like photographs. Um, very belabored paintings that don't have the artist's hand in them at all. Um, uh, we are all prisoners of a socially constructed identity. Uh, Postmoderns, postmodernist people believe that you don't have that much ability to do anything. Um, the decisions you make are affected by marketing. The decisions you make are affected by where you were born, what family you were born into, uh, what neighborhood you live in. Uh, your dreams and aspirations are affected by the dreams and aspirations you see on TV. Um, they would argue that there aren't very many things you have complete control of, which is an overarching kind of zeitgeist of, of the now. Um, their postmodernists are also a, a big believer in uh, Baudrillard's theory of simulacrum um, and simulation. Baudrillard believed that uh, simulacrum, the definition of it, is, it's a copy of something that no longer exists. Um, and we live in a heavily mediated culture that um, destroys real experience and um, interjects fake experience through media. So Baudrillard would argue after the age of three or four, you don't have any true connections to anything anymore. Um, you learn to handle a death in the family because you've been programmed to learn how to deal with a death in the family because you've seen a character you love die on a TV show you like. You know how appropriately to handle remorse, or appropriately handle um, agony, or appropriately handle uh, uh, betrayal. You learn all these things because you watch how actors and how people deal with it in movies, and, and that's how you react. Um, most people see a war, um, Baudrillard was really big into the Gulf War. Most people have seen war on TV far more than people have experienced in war. Uh, we live in a culture, fortunately, that isn't, uh, there is no war in America. Uh, we don't have war in our streets. We're not uh, 1860 Paris. We're not having cannons go through houses. But we all think we are aware of war because we get to watch it on television. Um, Baudrillard's big claim was that the uh, Gulf War never happened um, because the Gulf War was a very short war um, and uh, it was, watched horrifically. Um, when you think about it, for the first time, you can watch a video following a missile going into someone's house, and you completely detach from the idea that that represented the deaths of people in that house. You were watching something that didn't exist. You were watching uh, murder and death and watching it like it was a movie. Um, so that's what he meant by the Gulf War didn't happen, which is kind of chillingly true. You were watching homicide. You wa you, each house blown up in those videos is someone being killed, families being killed, not just adults. And you're watching it just like on Fox News or wherever. Um, so simulacrum also is, um, simulacrum is a little bit difficult to explain, but again, copies of things that don't exist. Uh, we're dealing with everything secondhand, sometimes through technology, but also through experience. Um, 
your iPhone, this is an example of simulacrum, your iPhone, when you take a photo, makes the photo snap sound. It doesn't need to take that photo, but it's a copy of something that serially won't exist anymore. It's trying to create that real experience through uh, uh, an MP3 of what the photographs should sound like. Um, Postmodernists and a lot of people, unfortunately, believe that reality doesn't exist, that we don't experience anything real anymore. Um, that's why there's a lot of uh, romanticism in the woods, or escaping culture, or getting out in the real experience. But even that, they would say, is not real anymore, because you're experiencing things as you've been taught to through National Geographic and uh, different media. Um, so nothing is real. Um, this is a really good quote by Warhol to kind of sum this up that I like. Um, he said, people say sometimes that the way things happen in movies is unreal, but actually it's the way things happen to you in life that's unreal. The movies make emotions look so strong and real, whereas when things really do happen to you, it's like watching television. You don't feel anything. Um, which I think sums up the hyper-reality or the simulation of reality or the simulacrum by Baudrillard perfectly. And it's true. We don't... Um, De Boer also talks about this in The Society of the Spectacle, which is an incredible essay, one of the definitive works of the latter half of the 20th century. Um, that we live in it, we live in a culture, we live in a society where we no longer can operate. We don't have agency anymore. We're watching everything unfold. Um, we're watching political systems where that supposedly represent everyone voting across the board, represents the votes of millions, but we're only allowed to vote for two people, and it's this guy or this guy. To, you know, um, the society of spectacle is saying, um, if, if politics are really supposed to represent us, how is it that out of you know, 300 million, I think, Americans, are summed up by two political parties? Um, and both of them are just reactionary to each other. You know, like, um, one party is against abortion because the other one is you know, um, pro-choice. You know? and, and people are making decisions that aren't even true down the line themselves because they're needing to react to the opposite party and create a didactic model, um, which isn't representative of the larger um, culture. Um, so, so uh, and the other part about the spectacle is uh, we don't have real, uh, back to it, we don't have real interactions anymore. Um, you can go to your job nine to five, uh, watch your friends on TV, watch uh, the people you want to get to know on TV. You can watch David Letterman, you can watch uh, people who you know better on the screen than you know your neighbor. And um, there's more and more, there's less and less of a reason to ever leave your house because everything you need can be ordered, everything you need um, can be felt through um, media. Um, so that's kind of the big scary thought of the society of the spectacle. So um, you have artists who are trying to kind of react to that and trying to create situations where you're getting out of yourself and directly being involved in people's lives and, and, and meeting them, which is... Uh, the postmodern man shamelessly exhibits themselves while revealing nothing. That's like the postmodern man model, that we know people, but we don't know anything about them. Like, um, I think like the most chilling moment for this, and, or one of them that typifies this was like a few years ago, um, David Letterman, someone we've had in our uh, living rooms for a long time. We all know him to a degree. We all love him or, you know, hear what he says. A few years ago, he tried to get ahead of a scandal and announced to everyone, may you remember this, that he was being accused of being in an affair, that he wasn't honest with his wife. And everyone in the TV audience started laughing because they thought it was a joke. Like, here's someone that they knew, but when he was trying to, like, put the guard down of David Letterman and trying to be a real person, people didn't know how to deal with that, um, like, that reaction. Uh, he shame, shamelessly shared everything about himself, but we don't know anything about his personal life. We don't actually know how he feels about things. Um, same thing, um, Michael Richards, actually, I think that happened in Letterman, too, um, coincidentally. But Michael Richards uh, said some awful, awful things. Uh, there was kind of a delay in that information getting out because it happened the night before. Um, they filmed... They filmed Letterman at like 2 in the afternoon, so not everyone had heard this story. And when he's trying to explain to people that he's 
really honest for using the words he used and, and saying these terrible things about people, people started laughing again because they weren't expecting a serious moment on Letterman. They weren't expecting um, anyone to actually feel anything real or have any kind of emotional response. So those are two kind of post-modern dissonances that I, I think are interesting. Um, Marina Abramovich, that's the next picture in your, your file. Um, and last year did a work called The Artist is Present. Um, she sat in the MoMA and sat in a chair and anyone could go up to her and sit across from her. Um, and it was her directly trying to stop this, um, this model that the artist is someone who's not known by the people they're showing their artwork to. She's sitting and anyone can sit across the table from her and she'll sit with them as long as they want to. She'll listen to them if they want to talk to her. Um, she'll cry with them if they need someone to cry to. Um, she essentially became this kind of um, secular uh, priest, or secular uh, uh, conf confessee. Um, so it was an interesting piece to kind of break out of this mode of not meeting or knowing anyone. Um, uh, Frederick Jameson talks about postmodernism and the new depth, depthless, depthlessness to it. Um, we're constantly excited about things. Uh, we get really excited about things for a really short amount of time. This is the funniest YouTube video I've ever seen. This is the funniest thing I've ever seen on the internet. Look at this internet meme. Is that how you say it? Um, it's really funny. This is the funniest thing everyone's got to look at. Everyone's got to look at it. A week later, you don't even remember it. Like, it's gone. So, like, there's this new, just across the board, depthless nature to all of us. So we're constantly taking information, being really excited about it, shaking it, dropping it, moving on. Um, that is what he says is a, a, a big thing about um, postmodernism. He also says that postmodernism, it's a very good book. It's kind of the definitive work describing postmodernism. It's huge. It takes forever, but it's here if you want to read it. Um, he also says that postmodernism reflects uh, something that I think is very true, the difference, the shift between irony and pastiche. Uh, irony being showing something and uh, paradistically objectifying it, saying like, look at this, it's stupid. Pastiche, he argues, is showing something and making no comment, which is far more postmodernism um, going on right now. Uh, the next one is a, a piece by Willem de Rouge, which is in the New National Gallery. Um, he took 17th century paintings made by uh, Melchior Don de Coter, exhibited them again in a museum, and he arranged them in a way that um, he, by arranging them the way he did, it made a comment, but he didn't make a comment. Um, this work is still confusing cr uh, critics, and it's the artist's curator. It's taking information and just presenting it, rather than making a comment on it, rather than making anything. Um, that's something that artists are starting to do more and more, is collecting things, showing things, not making a comment on things. Um, so that's, that's kind of a good embodiment of that. Um, uh, Reticence is the new excess. That's a quote by Terry Smith. Um, not saying anything is saying too much now. So you want to say as little as you can as a postmodern artist. You don't want to say this is right or this is wrong. You don't want to say this is um, this means only this. You're trying to say as little as you can. Um, that's kind of what's going on. The next piece is Lorraine O'Grady. Um, it's it was in the last Whitney Biennial. And this was like the work that kind of surfaced from it. It was the most talked about work. Um, it's called The First and the Last of the Modernists. And it went, it was a series of photos that were juxtaposing Baudelaire and Michael Jackson and um, with accompanying essays that made the argument that Baudelaire was the first modernist, Michael Jackson was the last modernist. And um, by showing them in photos, she was making a comparison and contrast without making any direct comment. Um, that both of them were exemplified modernism. He obviously began it, Michael Jackson ended it, both believed heavily in their projects and what they were doing for the world. Both of them kind of had inverse trajectories doing it. Baudelaire came from a lot of money, um, lost it all, and kind of uh, chose nomadicism. And uh, Michael Jackson came from nothing, shot into superstardom. And so he's showing these photos kind of as those, those things cross over and um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of the Whitney Biennial this year. It's, 
exemplifying that. We have artists like uh, Corey Archangel and uh, Christian Markley who are using, who are um, mining their information, mining their sources from YouTube directly. Um, Corey Archangel did a really, I don't even know how he did it, it's a really difficult piece. If I could show video, I would. He took um, Arnold Schoenberg, I'm not a huge person and musician, but Arnold Schoenberg was kind of a postmodern musician or piano player, believed in making dissonance and uh, making, didn't believe in timing, so if you listen to it, it sounds just like random noise often. And he recreated that piece by taking cat videos from YouTube and splicing them in the correct order where it sounds like Schoenberg, but he went, he's looked through, has to be millions of cat videos to get the right keys. So a cat hits one with its paw, it uses that, holds it out for three seconds, uses another one. Um, I don't even know how many hours he took to make that, but uh, it's taking, it's mining YouTube. Uh, Christian Markley made a video quartet by making all these people kind of sing the same keys by breaking them up and showing them together. Um, man, there's so much. Um, do, how, how's everyone doing? Do we want to break this up into another one? Uh, I, like, uh, we can, what time is it? Time to 10 till 5. 10 till 5, oh my gosh, let's, let's stop. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I, um, someone needs to stop me. Um, there's a lot to get through. Uh, we can kind of continue with this. I'm sorry guys, I didn't mean to talk for so long. But um, uh, yeah, let's take a break. We'll get to uh, theories next, next week. Um, are there any questions? Sorry, I'm talking to you for so long. Uh, I think I'm already losing the artist, but the quote was, reticence is the new excess. Yep. And what we said, the way we, uh, editorial, the way we followed up on that was to say that, that um, the goal is to say as little as possible in this movement. Right. This is a diction question. <laughs> if reticence is the new excess, is the goal to be Excessive, or was this artist um, criticizing over reticence, criticizing you know cute and precious reticence, right. and calling more for um, mediated statement? You know, with a yeah. something to say, but not necessarily trying to prevent, you know, pre pretend we have nothing to say and like work standard. Right. Ter Terry Smith is a. Uh, a critic, and he, given the context of how he wrote that and the passage he's writing, what he was saying was like the equivalent of like soft is too loud now. Okay. Like um, so, he meant it in that way, not reticence is be, is being used excessively. He meant it as reticence is the new is uh, reticence is the excess. Um, well, here it's like understatement is overstatement. Exactly. Partly because of right. overuse. But so you need to do the ex not to understate, or is he saying that he's, that's the right he's saying that understatement is even too much of an overstatement. He's saying that understatement is too much. You need to shoot for non-statement. Okay, all right. That's what he means by that. I see. So but yeah, I, it's not a reverse polarity. Right. So yeah, I played with that quote for a long time. But context-wise, he's saying that not enough is still too much. I guess. Okay. Anyone else? Thanks, everyone. Thank you.